So, dear friends, today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, our practices for conflict resolution. Thich Nhat Hanh uh, experienced the horrors of war in Vietnam, and because of that, he spent 70 years of his life looking deeply at the causes of war. What he discovered was that it's the anger, hatred, and violence in each one of us that is at the root cause of the wars that happen. Uh, one of the difficulties is that we are suffering under the misperception that we're separate from each other. Uh, <clears throat> Albert Einstein said, a human being is part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So I like the way he talks about an optical delusion, a delusion of our consciousness. Um, and this misperception uh, can be at the root of all kinds of misunderstandings and misperceptions. Uh, we need to be able to uh, understand our interconnection so that we can heal the conflicts in, inside ourselves and with each other. Uh, we can end uh, hostilities, which uh, uh, we've seen happen in the past, but unless we reconcile, we just create the conditions. We sow the seeds for uh, further hostilities. We plant the seeds for future wars. This has uh, been borne out by history over and over again. Um, the First World War was the war to end all wars. It was horrific, brutal, um, and within 20 years of it ending, the Second World War started. And the way in which the Germans were uh, convinced to go to war was to renew, to restore their um, uh, sense of pride in Germany because they'd been humiliated by the First World War. The same thing happens in our interpersonal relationships that um, uh, somebody does or says something, we get upset, and uh, we want to prove that we're right and they're wrong, we're good and they're bad. Um, we can arm ourselves with lots of facts, we can win an argument, and what we find out is in doing so, we've probably just ended the conflict, but uh, we've only sowed the seeds for future conflicts. If we wind up humiliating the other person, the resentment is there. So, when uh, Thich Nhat Hanh looked deeply at this, he gave us practices for conflict resolution, and they're really precious gifts. Uh, if someone does or says something to upset us, it's up to us to um, not do or say anything. That's the instruction we're given. A lot of people get upset by this and they think that uh, uh, it means that we just keep everything bottled up and we hold on to all of our uh, uh, hostility and resentment. It couldn't be farther from the truth. What he has uh, suggested that we do and what really seems to work is when we feel the energy of anger, the energy of irritation arising in us, we stop. We don't say or do anything in that moment. We breathe deeply three times and we want to look deeply to understand what's really going on with me. What is this really about? And um, neuroscientists have, uh, they're helping us to understand why this works so well that um, they found out that we have been habituated to be very sensitized to any, any perceived threat of any kind. And when we're feeling that somebody has done something hurtful, uh, immediately our limbic system is activated, the emotional centers of the brain. 
get activated. And uh, that is the part where we, it just causes us to react. We just react out of habit. However we've been conditioned, whatever we've learned from our experience in terms of protecting and defending ourselves, we just react and do that. And when we stop and breathe and look deeply, we're shifting circuitry in our brain that we go from having the limbic system activated. When we stop and we say, I've got to breathe to my belly three times, what we're doing is uh, shifting the circuitry from the limbic system to the prefrontal cortex because we're having a thought instead of a feeling. We think, I've got to breathe three times. By doing that, the circuitry's changed. The prefrontal cortex is where we can make decisions. And so it allows us to stop and think how can we respond rather than react? And it can save us a lot of suffering for ourselves, and we don't create as much suffering for other people. So that's the first step. Um, what this does is it helps us to create a space between the stimulus and the response. We buy that time, and uh, we get the time to choose how to respond. It is a huge gift, and it can save so much suffering for ourselves and other people. Um, once we've gotten ourselves calmed down and we haven't reacted in the moment, then the instruction is to look deeply at um, what part have I played in this difficulty? Um, that we have to, he says that if we get to the heart of any difficulty, we find that there's a misperception. And very frequently, if somebody says or does something, that's upsetting or hurts our feelings or gets us angry. And we do have the chance to stop and look deeply to understand what's really going on. What we find is that we're responding from old hurts and wounds in our own consciousness. A lot of times uh, we've been powerfully conditioned, um, say as children, uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe I was criticized and judged a lot as a child. Then my uh, natural response is to be mm, defended. And somebody says or does something that uh, uh, I find to be hurtful, uh, I will react from that hurt child rather than from the adult. Uh, another place where we see this a lot is people feeling powerless, that um, uh, we just had, we just, uh, have been in the midst of the holiday season, and I've had a lot of people uh, talking to me about their anxiety over being with people with whom they disagree, and um, uh, feeling intimidated and fearful. And what happens is that they're not coming from the adult place, that it's really that child in them that has been hurt in the past. One woman was going to be spending time with a parent who had been very abusive, uh, the whole time she was growing up and into adulthood had uh, continued to be verbally abusive and um, she was needing to go and spend a week uh, with this parent and she was really really anxious and what became clear was it was the little girl that had been so hurt in her who was uh, terrified of uh, going back and revisiting the situation when in fact she's an adult. So the other thing that Thich Nhat Hanh suggests is we take very good care of that child in us, that um, we have to uh, go back to that little girl, she needed to go back to that little girl, and have a conversation and let that little girl understand that um, uh, she understood why the little girl was so upset, why she was so fearful. It made really good sense. It was the logical outcome considering the conditioning she'd had. Um, so it was perfectly reasonable that she would be afraid. But then the good news that she needed to, to let her know was that we're not three anymore, that uh, we're all grown up and we've got a car and we've got car keys. And uh, we don't have to sit still and be powerless at all that we are adults and we have lots of uh, agency, lots of options and things we can do. Um, the thing that was very beautiful was that um, uh, I reminded her of all of the practices we have, 
that uh, we can send metta to ourselves. We can um, uh, just understand the other person's suffering. That when we look deeply at people that are nasty, what we find is that they themselves have been powerfully conditioned and they're suffering quite a lot, and that's why they create suffering for other people. When we can hit to the place of understanding, we can feel a lot of compassion for them. So we wind up feeling compassion for ourselves and for the other person. And uh, this is what happened for my friend. She uh, called after her visit, and she was so happy. And she said, I can't believe it. I didn't have to use any of the tools that I have. She said, um, I can't believe how much, uh, much my parent has changed. And it turned out that um, I said, you did have to use all the tools that you have because you knowing that you had them is what gave you the confidence. Um, and anybody that's a bully really can feel the energetic transmission that somebody's not available to be bullied. And clearly, uh, her parent felt that very clearly. She said they never had had a better uh, visit and that not once did they try to be uh, nasty or abusive. So um, we need to take really good care of the wounding in ourselves. We need to look deeply and say, in this present situation, am I responding from that hurt child in me, or am I really responding to this present situation? Um, and if we're responding from the little, the little child, we have lots of practices for uh, going back and doing some healing. Once we've done that, sometimes we find that we don't even have to talk to the person who was upsetting us, that they simply were the catalyst to touch those wounded places in us. Um, but sometimes we can, we can do that healing, and we still feel that there's a little knot of resentment in our consciousness. And um, <clears throat> so what we then have to do is to uh, uh, meet with the other person. And uh, we do a practice called beginning anew. Now, I talk about having compassion for ourselves and the other person. Compassion is very, very difficult. I really love, there's a quote by uh, Henry Nouwen, uh, the Dutch theologian. And he says, sometimes, <coughs> uh, oh, here we go. Uh, he says, let us not underestimate how hard it is to be compassionate. Compassion is hard because it requires the inner disposition to go with others to places where they are weak, vulnerable, lonely, and broken. But this is not our spontaneous response to suffering. What we desire most is to do away with suffering by fleeing from it or finding a quick cure for it. When I first heard this uh, quote, I thought that's exactly what the Buddha was teaching, that the Buddha said that uh, the first noble truth is suffering exists. And what he knew to be true and what remains true is that none of us want to be with our suffering. We either want to flee or fix it real quickly. And um, what then happens is that we never can get through it. We never can transform and heal it. Um, and so we're encouraged to actually embrace our suffering. Thich Nhat Hanh says, embrace your suffering as a mother would a, a small child, a crying baby, that you have to look deeply to see what does the baby need. Uh, so we really need to develop enough courage to be with our own suffering. And what that does is it allows us, when we do the, the healing in ourselves, it allows us to be present for the suffering in other people. I don't know how many times you might have had um, the experience that you would be suffering. You would be talking to somebody and letting them know about the difficulty you were having, and their response was to hurry up and try to give you advice on how to fix it. Uh, how to hurry up and put an end to your suffering because it made them too anxious. Uh, so compassion is not as easy as it sounds, that um, it requires us to go to those places in ourselves where we're broken and weak and vulnerable. And uh, that way it allows us to develop more and more courage, to become more and more fearless, and that allows us to be with other people suffering as well. So... Um, when we go back to do this healing, I think it's really important. A lot of people are fearful of this, 
And I think it's important that we um, uh, hold ourselves with nothing but compassion and understand that the mistakes that we've made are just the logical outcome of our conditioning and the habits that we've developed because of it. So um, it's not that we're horrible, terrible people or that we have to be judging and critical of ourselves. We just need to look deeply enough to understand that when we get to that place of understanding, there's nothing but compassion. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh teaches us that mindfulness leads to concentration, concentration to insight, insight to understanding, and understanding to compassion. And that has been my experience every time. So uh, when we can um, uh, develop that kind of a relationship with ourselves, when we can uh, uh, learn to uh, accept our humanity, to accept all of our mistakes, and uh, to get to the place of non-blame. There's no blame, there's just understanding. And understanding is what allows us to love ourselves and each other more deeply. Um, so if we have done, uh, taken good care of ourselves, taken good care of those difficult emotions in us, uh, and we still find that there's the seed of resentment or, or hurt uh, that's left from this encounter that we've had where we feel uh, that a person was unkind, um, then we need to do what the practice is called beginning anew. And beginning anew, um, uh, we can do it formally or informally, there's a formal practice of beginning anew. If we're working with another practitioner, uh, they'll know what we mean. <laughs> and so we invite them. Uh, Thai suggests that we take at least uh, 24 hours, and usually it's a week or two, that we want to spend with ourselves, really looking deeply and understanding. So when we have a chance to talk with the other person, we can be very clear and non-judgmental and non-blaming. Um, when we do get together to do beginning anew, there are four steps. The first step to beginning anew is appreciation. And um, we want to be able to offer the person three, what we call flower waterings. We want to offer them three things that we appreciate about them. And they need to be sincere. It's not, uh, I, I like your haircut. <laughs> we need to offer them reasons why we really value them. And uh, just by doing that, we soften our own hearts, and we can soften the heart of the person that we're, we're, we're talking with. And uh, when we do the beginning anew, it's agreed upon that one person will speak, and the other person only listens. There's no crosstalk. There's no uh, discussion. It's just offering um, the insights that we've come to when we've looked deeply at this difficulty. And so uh, we offer appreciations. And we offer beneficial regret is the second step. And what the beneficial regret consists of is all the things we've come to understand from um, our looking deeply. Uh, we could say something like, I've thought about that disagreement that we had. And when I looked at the part that I played in it, I could see that I was really unskillful in this way. And we can offer the way or ways. Sometimes there's many ways that we were not as skillful as we might have been. And um, we could also, depending on the relationship, if we're close friends, we could offer that um, uh, I could see that I was reacting really strongly because I have uh, had a lot of these, uh, uh, the seeds of hurt um, watered in my consciousness uh, from when I was a child. And I could see that that was really coming up from my store consciousness to my mind consciousness. And that's where I was reacting from. Uh, so that's why I reacted as strongly as I did. Uh, and then the third step is to share with the other person how you had been hurt. And I have found in my own experience that sharing the hurt, um, uh, it's much, I feel that uh, I can be, um, uh, a lot more uh, open 
and that I could enlist the other person's help rather than have it sound like it's any kind of blame or criticism involved, to ask for help that um, when you said this, uh, that really uh, watered some old seeds in me and touched old wounded places in me. And those are things I've been trying to heal in myself. So I just wanted to let you know that that's the effect it had on me. And it would really be a huge help if you could try really hard not to do that, if you could help me, because I'm trying to heal those places in myself. Something like that, that instead of blame and criticism, ask for help. And um, the fourth step is uh, reconciliation. And sometimes we get to a place of reconciliation, and sometimes we don't. Uh, it's not a magic wand that automatically fixes everything. But um, sometimes we can do a unilateral beginning anew. Uh, sometimes we'll do that part of the beginning anew, and the other person will say, hmm, I want to think about what you've shared. Let's get together next week, and I'll share with you. Um, and they go through the same four steps. Um, sometimes they feel perfectly fine about just responding in the moment, and that's OK, too. Uh, sometimes, if it's an old hurt, that's been there for a long, long time and has really tied a tight knot in your consciousness, then you need to um, probably ask an experienced practitioner to help facilitate beginning anew. And I have facilitated a lot of beginning anews. And what I've found is that almost always, when people follow these steps and when they really are sincerely trying to understand, um, that it can be incredibly healing the part that is so uh, revolutionary, I think, in this practice is that it's not about being right. It's not about winning an argument. It's not about uh, uh, I'm right, you're wrong, I'm good, you're bad. It, there is no dualistic uh, aspect to it, which is sort of how I was conditioned. Uh, my own conditioning was that uh, somebody was bad and I should blame them and judge them and criticize them and then I should collect all the facts and I could confront them with all the facts and I could win. And like I said before, all that does is sow the seeds for future conflict. It just hurts people, humiliates another person, and it really doesn't work. Um, so with beginning anew, it's really about reconciliation. Uh, it's about deepening our our connection. It's about deepening our relationship um, instead of winning. There's nothing in it about winning. Um, and sometimes uh, the other person's not a practitioner. Sometimes they have no idea um, what we're talking about. And we can still do beginning anew because the main, the main purpose in beginning anew is to untie the knots in our own consciousness, to make sure we're not caught in holding on to anger and resentment. Um, somebody said to hold on to resentment is like um, uh, drinking poison, hoping the person you're angry with will die. And um, it's really hurtful to ourselves. So it's an act of deep compassion to us, uh, to ourselves, to do beginning anew, to do our best to be as honest with ourselves and each other as we can be and uh, get freed up. Um, and like I said, sometimes we can do a unilateral beginning anew. That I've done beginning anew very often with people who are not practitioners. And um, I simply uh, do the process myself. The most important part of beginning anew, I hope I've made this clear, is the part we do before we ever meet with the other person. Um, just trying our best to understand ourselves, to really get to the, the heart of this, um, the misperception. Uh, I know I came from a place where uh, I had a father who was uh, very angry a lot of the time. And I had uh, interpreted that as a child as being that I was doing it wrong. I was doing something wrong. If I were a better person, he wouldn't be so angry. And um, uh, when I started practicing with that, and I would go back and revisit that little girl in me, what I found out was that it had almost nothing to do with me. My father was a World War II veteran. He had uh, grown up in very uh, difficult circumstances in Appalachia. Uh, he had had a lot of suffering. 
And uh, as a three-year-old, I had no idea um, that adults suffered. They were the ones in charge of everything. So um, I just, in my own little three-year-old mind, uh, decided that I was the cause of the problem. What I realized when I started practicing and looking back and taking care of that little girl in me was it had nothing to do with me at all, that it was my father's suffering. That was the misperception at the heart of the difficulty. So um, when we can recognize that, I can have nothing but compassion for that little girl in me. Um, I can understand a whole lot of uh, the habit energy that I've carried forward based on that treatment that I received and the misperception. Um, I can look at my father and see that uh, there's no blame, that uh, uh, he was suffering terribly and uh, he had really good reasons for his suffering, um, really good reasons for his anger, and I needed to understand that it had nothing to do with me. It was his suffering. It wasn't about me. And then when I could understand that, I'm freed up. That um, uh, in the present moment, if the defenses come up in me, I can recognize them for what they are and not be carried away by them. I don't have to react. Uh, it is a total blessing. So if you're doing a unilateral beginning anew, maybe I'll just invite a friend out for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and um, share the things I deeply appreciate about that person. And then I will um, uh, offer my beneficial regret. You know that discussion we had last Thursday and I felt, really felt upset afterwards. I had to really spend some time looking at what was going on with me. And um, then I had these insights and I could share the insights with that person. And then I could say uh, the same thing about uh, uh, these are the things in myself I'm trying to, to heal and not uh, strengthen. And uh, I hope you can help me out. Um, this is the, um, the beautiful thing, uh, I think, is that we are really encouraged in our practice to take very good care of our own consciousness. So uh, taking the time to look deeply in order to understand, to develop compassion for ourselves, um, we're able to free ourselves up. Um, and I've done, like I said, a lot of facilitation of these beginning and news. And almost every time, if people do what they need to do, what we find out when we come together to do the beginning anew is that it was two children having an argument, that um, the old wounds got triggered and two people were just reacting from those old wounded places in themselves. Um, I had two friends years ago, this is several years ago, who got into a great big fight and um, they tried to do beginning anew and they weren't ready to do it at all. They hadn't done the uh, preparation that needed to get done with themselves. And so it only made things worse. And um, so they asked me to facilitate for them. And I said, fine, as long as you spend two weeks just looking at the part you played in the difficulty, and then we'll, we'll meet to do the beginning anew. So we did that. And by the time we met to do beginning anew, uh, the one realized that she had been um, uh, her father had left the family when she was very, very young. Her mother had become an alcoholic, so she had been abandoned uh, by everybody. And the other woman had had her father die when she was very young. And the, the root cause of their argument was that they really had, the one woman had been very hurt because she felt the other woman was not there for her, that she wanted her help, and the other woman said she didn't have time. And that just triggered all of this old stuff in her about abandonment. You say you love me, but you're not there for me. All of the old stuff. But when they both had done the, the necessary preparation, they came to the beginning anew, went through the steps of beginning anew, and the one woman looked at the other and said, oh my gosh, it's like two kids that, uh, that were having this argument. And um, we can really help each other to heal. 
uh, and this is what I found over and over again, is that um, uh, when beginning anew is done well, when uh, we take the time prior to the beginning anew to prepare ourselves to really understand what's going on with us, that the uh, beginning anew can help us to feel even closer and more intimate with people rather than breaking up a friendship. That uh, in my own experience in the past, when somebody would say or do something hurtful, I would want nothing to do with them ever again. Uh, and this has been such a joy to see how when we create a safe container in which we can uh, uh, very honestly and openly be with each other, we become more intimate and we deepen our friendships. And this can come out of conflict. It's really beautiful. So, um, we have to take very, very good care of our own consciousness. Um, and we need to recognize that we're creating our consciousness every minute of our lives. So we need to be very mindful of uh, what we're taking in. Um, are we watering the highest and best seeds in our consciousness, or are we watering all the most unwholesome seeds in our consciousness? Because the outcome is just, uh, will be logical. If we uh, water all unwholesome seeds, we're going to probably be very, very unhappy. And then we have to also understand we're co-creating each other's consciousness. That um, every person that I come in contact with, I am helping to create their consciousness. Am I watering the highest and best in them, or am I watering the most unwholesome seeds in them? A lot of times a person who's difficult, we want to berate and demean and discount and tell them how awful they are so that they're going to be a better person. It never works. Um, the best thing we can do is look for what is it that's wonderful in this person and how can we strengthen those things uh, in them. Um, if we can resolve all conflicts, however small, uh, what we find out is that we can become a lot better lovers, that we can love each other, we can, uh, we also get in touch with, like I said, our own humanity and what we have in common with 100% of human beings, that we all make mistakes. And um, uh, we all have been conditioned and we all have developed habits habits of mind, a lot of habit energy. And when we can see ourselves in everyone, when we understand ourselves, it makes it so much easier to understand everybody else. And then there's a lot less judgment and criticism. There's no need for it. And um, we become better lovers. We become freer. And we become a whole lot happier. Uh, Buddhism is called the path of liberation. And that is exactly what I found it to be. Um, I just wanted to end today with a quote from uh, a writer, L.R. Nost. And she says, Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things break and all things can be mended, not with time, as they say, but with intention. So go, love intentionally, extravagantly, unconditionally, the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is you. And when we can resolve all conflicts in ourselves and with each other, we are much better able to, uh, to love intentionally, extravagantly, and unconditionally. Um, and hopefully, we can uh, uh, transmit that light to everybody that we meet. And in closing, I would just like to say, if there are things in this talk that you have uh, found that you'd like to pursue or find out more about, there's a very good book that Thich Nhat Hanh has offered us called Reconciliation. And most of the practices that I've talked about are outlined in that book. So we will end with three sounds of the bell, as we always do. Coming back to ourselves, breathing and just enjoying being in this moment.
So dear friends, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this talk. And uh, I hope I've offered you something that you can put into use um, to transform some of your own suffering, to become freer and happier. And I'd like to offer my deepest gratitude to my teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, for all that he's given us, a whole lifetime of practice and uh, uh, beautiful guidelines uh, so that we can be a lot freer and a lot happier. So thank you.